Questions to the Prime Minister. Wendy Morton. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Wendy Morton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week in Aldridge Brownhills I visited laser form manufacturing and pot clays who supplied clay for the Tower of London poppies. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that supporting small businesses and the further increase in personal income tax allowance which came in this month shows that unlike Labour, we on this side of the House are the party of enterprise and aspiration and believe in enabling hard working people to keep more of the money they earn? Let me join her in congratulating the firm that she mentioned. She's absolutely right that it is small and medium-sized businesses that predominantly will be providing the jobs of the future, and we want people to keep more of their own money to spend as they choose. And that's why the historic move last week to an £11,000 personal allowance means that people will have gained by 2018. They'll be paying about £1,000 less per taxpayer, and we would have taken four million of the lowest paid people out of tax altogether. That's the action of a progressive Conservative government. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm sure the whole House will join me in mourning the death today of the dramatist Arnold Wesker, one of the great playwrights of this country, one of those wonderful angry young men of the 1950s, and like so many angry young people, actually changed the face of our country. Um, Yesterday, Mr Speaker, the European Commission announced new proposals on country-by-country tax reporting so that companies must declare where they make their profits in the EU and in blacklisted tax havens. Conservative MEPs voted against the proposal for country-by-country reporting and against the blacklisting. Can the Prime Minister now assure us that Conservative MEPs will support the new proposal? Well, first of all, let me join the honourable right, gentleman in, in, in mourning the loss of the famous playwright and all the work that he did. He's quite right to, to mention that. Uh, let, me, um, let, me, uh, let me also welcome, let me welcome the country-by-country country tax reporting proposal put forward by Commissioner Jonathan Hill, appointed by this government, the United Kingdom Commissioner. This is very much based on the work that we've been doing, leading the collaboration between countries of making sure that we share tax information. And as we discussed on Monday, this has gone far faster and far further under this government than under any previous government. Mr Speaker, if the proposals were put forward by the British Government, why did Conservative MEPs then vote against them? There seems to be a sort of a bit of a disconnect here. Uh, The Panama Papers, Mr Speaker, exposed the scandalous situation where wealthy individuals seem to believe that corporation tax and other taxes are something optional. Indeed, as the member for Rutland and Melton informed us, it's only for low achievers, apparently. So when the HMRC says that the tax gap is £34 billion, why then is he cutting HMRC staff by 20% and cutting down tax offices, which loses the expertise of people to close that tax gap? Well, I'm glad he wants to get on to our responsibilities to pay our taxes. I think that's uh, very important. I thought his tax return was a metaphor for Labour policy. It was late, it was chaotic, it was inaccurate, it was uncosted. That's exactly what I'm Turning to, the, turning to the specific questions, he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right to identify the tax gap, and that is why we closed off loopholes in the last Parliament, equivalent of £12 billion. We aim to close off loopholes in this Parliament, equivalent to £16 billion. So the HMRC is taking very strong action, backed by this Government, backed by the Chancellor, legislated for by this House. And I think I'm right in saying that since 2010, we've put actually over a billion pounds into HMRC to increase its capabilities to collect the tax that people should be paying. The difference, I think, between this side of the House and the right honourable gentleman is we believe in setting low tax rates and encouraging people to pay them. And it's working. 
Mr Speaker, I'm grateful to the Prime Minister for drawing attention to my own tax return. There, warts and all, the warts being my handwriting, all being my generous donation to HMRC. I actually paid more tax than uh, some companies owned by people that he might know quite well. The Prime Minister isn't... Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister isn't cutting tax abuse, he's cutting down on tax collectors. The tax collected helps to fund our NHS and all the other services. Last month, the OBR reported that HMRC doesn't have the necessary resources to tackle offshore tax disclosures. The Government is committed to taking £400 million out of HMRC's budget by 2020. Will he now commit to reversing that cut so that we can collect the tax that will help to pay for the services? I'm afraid his, his figures, rather like his tax return, his figures aren't entirely accurate. Um, at the summer budget 2015, we gave an extra £800 million to HMRC to fund additional work to tackle tax evasion and non-compliance between now and 2021. This is going to enable HMRC to recover a cumulative £7.2 billion in tax over the next five years. And we've already brought in more than £2 billion from offshore tax evaders since 2010. But the point I'd make to him, I think we should try and uh, bring some... Uh, consensus to this issue. For years in this country, Labour governments and Conservative governments had an attitude to the Crown dependencies in the overseas territories that their tax affairs were a matter for them, and their compliance affairs were a matter for them, and their transparency was a matter for them. This government has changed that. We got the overseas territories, we got the Crown dependencies round the table, we said you've got to have registers of ownership, you've got to collaborate with the UK government, you've got to make sure people don't have their taxes and it's happening so when he gets to his feet he should welcome the fact that huge progress has been made raising taxes sorting out the overseas territories and crown dependencies closing the tax gap getting businesses to pay more giving international leadership to this whole issue all things that never happened under labor Mr Speaker, I thank the Prime Minister for that answer. The only problem with it is that the Red Book states HMRC spending will fall from £3.3 billion to £2.9 billion by 2020. And on rega- in regard to UK Crown dependencies and overseas territories, only two days ago the Prime Minister said that uh, he had agreed that they will provide, these are the overseas territories, they will provide UK law enforcement and tax agencies with full access to information on the beneficial ownership of companies. There seems to be some confusion here because the Chief Minister of Jersey said this is in response to a need for information without delay where terrorist activities are involved. Obviously we welcome his commitment to fighting terrorism, but is Jersey and all the other, all the other dependencies actually going to provide beneficial ownership information or not? The, the short answer to that is yes, they are. Uh, and that is what's such a big breakthrough. Look, I totally accept they're not going as far as us because we are publishing a register of beneficial ownership that will happen in June, will be one of the only countries in the world to do so. I think Norway and Spain are the others. What the Overseas Territories and Crown Dependencies are doing is making sure that we have full access to registers of beneficial ownership to make sure that people aren't evading or avoiding their taxes. Now, in the interests of giving full answers to to, uh, his questions. Let me give him the figures for full time ap- ac- equivalents in HMRC in terms of compliance. The numbers are going from 25,000 in 2010 to 26,798 in 2015. It's not how much money you spend on an organisation, it's how many people you can actually have out there collecting the taxes and making sure the forms are properly filled in. Well, he's, uh, Prime, the Prime Minister is quite right. The number of people out there collecting taxes is important. Therefore, why has he laid off so many staff of HMRC who therefore cannot collect those taxes? In 2013, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister demanded that the overseas territories rip aside the cloak of secrecy by creating a public register of beneficial ownership of in- information. Will he now make it clear that the Beneficial Ownership Register will be an absolutely public document, transparent for all to see who really owns these companies and 
whether they're paying their taxes or not. Let, let me be absolutely clear. For the United Kingdom, we have taken the unprecedented step, never done by Labour, never done previously by Conservatives, of an open beneficial ownership register. With the Crown Dependencies and Overseas Territories, they have to give full access to the registers of beneficial ownership. We did not choose the option of forcing them to have a public register because we believed if that was the case, we get into the situation that he spoke about, is some of them might have walked away from this cooperation altogether. That's the point. The question is, are we going to be able to access the information? Yes. Are we going to be able to pursue tax evaders? Yes. Did any of these things happen under a Labour government? No. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister does talk very tough, and I grant him that. The only problem is it's not a public register that he's offering us. He's only offering us a private register that some people can see. And it's quite interesting that the... Chief, the Premier of the Cayman Islands, Alder McLaughlin, is today apparently celebrating his victory over the Prime Minister because he is saying the information certainly will not be available publicly or available directly by any UK or non Cayman Islands agency. The Prime Minister is supposed to be chasing down tax evasion and tax avoidance. He's supposed to be bringing it all into the open. If he cannot even persuade the Premier of the Cayman Islands or Jersey to open up their books, where is the tough talk bringing the information we need to collect the taxes that should pay for the services that people need? Let me, let me, I think he's misunderstanding what I've said. In terms of the UK, it is an absolute first in terms of a register of beneficial ownership that is public. You keep saying it's not public. The British one will be public. Further to that, and I think this is important because it goes to a question asked by the right honourable member for Tottenham, we're also saying to foreign companies that have dealings with Britain that they have to declare their properties and the properties they own, which will remove a huge veil of secrecy over the ownership, for instance, of London property. Now, I am not saying we've completed all this work, but we've got more tax information exchange, more registers of beneficial ownership, more chasing down tax evasion and avoidance, more money recovered from businesses and individuals, and all of these things are things that have happened under this government. The truth is, he's running to catch up because Labour did nothing in 13 years. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituents, John and Penny Clough, whose daughter Jane was tragically murdered by her ex-partner whilst he was out on bail, are campaigning to save Lancashire's nine women's refuges, uh, which are currently at threat because Labour-run Lancashire County Council are proposing to cut all of their funding. Does the Prime Minister agree with the Clough family and me that Labour-run Lancashire County Council should prioritise the victims of domestic violence? Well, first of all... First of all, my honourable friend does, move a very, uh, does raise a very moving case, and I know the whole House will wish to join me in sending our sincere condolences to Mr and Mrs Clough. In terms of making sure we stop violence against women and girls, no one should be living in fear of these crimes. That is why we committed £80 million of extra funding to 2020 to tackle violence against women and girls, and this does include funding for, a, for and securing the future for refuges and other accommodation-based services, but it obviously helps if local councils Councils make the right decisions as well. Angus Robertson. The United Kingdom and its offshore territories and dependencies collectively sits at the top of the financial secrecy index of the Tax Justice Network. Since the leaking of the Panama Papers, France has put Panama on a blacklist of uncooperative tax havens, and the Mossack Fonseca offices have been raided by the police in Panama City. What have British authorities done specifically in relation to Mossack Fonseca and with Panama since the leak of the Panama Papers? Yeah. Well, first of all, in terms of who is at the top of the pyramid of uh, tax uh, secrecy, I think it is now unfair to say that about our Crown Dependencies and Overseas Territories because they are going to cooperate with the three things that we ask them to do in terms of the standard, the reporting standard, the exchange of tax information and now access to registers of beneficial ownership. Frankly, that is more than we get out of some states in America, like Delaware. So I think in this House we should be tough 
on all those that facilitate uh, um, lack of transparency, but we should be accurate in the way we do it. He asked about what we're doing about the Panama Papers. We have a £10 million funded cross-agency review to get to the bottom of all the relevant information. It would hugely be helped if the newspapers and other investigative journalists now share this information with tax inspectors so we can get to the bottom of it. And his final question on uh, blacklists. We, we're happy to support blacklists, but we don't think you should draw up a blacklist solely on the basis of a territory uh, raising a low tax rate. We don't think that is the right approach. That's the approach the French have sometimes taken in the past. But in terms of taking action against uh, tax havens, uh, this government has done more than any previous one. Thanks, Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Uh, speaker, uh, 3,250 DWP staff have been specifically investigating benefit fraud, whilst only 300 HMRC staff have been systematically investigating tax evasion. Surely, surely we should care equally about people abusing the tax system and those abusing the benefit system. Why? Why? Has this government had ten times more staff dealing often with the poorest in society abusing benefits than with the super rich evading their taxes? Uh, I, I will look carefully at his statistics, but they sound to me entirely bogus. For this reason, the job of the predominant job of the DWP is to make sure that people receive their benefits. The predominant job of HMRC is to make sure people pay their taxes. The 26,000 people I spoke about earlier, all of them are making sure that people pay their taxes. That's the, cl the clues in the title. Jesse Norman. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will and Carol Davis and many other farmers in South Herefordshire are still awaiting their 2015 payments from the Rural Payments Agency, yeah, yeah, yeah. nearly four months after they were due. This follows the failure of the RPA website last year. It is causing great personal and financial distress and threatens the future of farm businesses. Will the Prime Minister agree to meet with farmers on this issue? Will he press the RPA to make these payments by the end of this month? And does he share my view that, at the very least, farmers should receive interest on the amounts overdue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I have met recently with both the uh, NFU and the Welsh NFU and I continue to have meetings uh, with farming organisations, including my own constituency. I, I know there have been problems with the payment system. Let me give them the, rate the latest figures are that some 87% of all claims have been paid, and I believe that the figures for Herefordshire are in line with the national average. But obviously that's no consolation for the 13% that haven't received those payments. That's why we have a financial hardship process. We're working with charities. We've made hardship payments and amounting to over £7 million, but we do need to make sure that the lessons of how to make the system work better in future years are properly learned. Douglas Carswell. If the British people vote to leave the European Union, will the Prime Minister remain in office to implement their decision? Yes. Again on Europe, Mr Speaker. Uh, does the Prime Minister agree with me that the European Union is not just the world's biggest single market, but it is also an ample source of foreign direct investment, providing 50% of the, of the investment that we receive, and also an excellent platform for supply chains to thrive and prosper, meaning, uh, a, the, meaning the ability to get the skills that they need and the in innovation that they need? And that, for Stroud, my constituency, means the Sartorius, Renishaw, Delphi, and a whole load of other high tech companies thrive and prosper as they do in the United Kingdom. Yeah. Well, I well remember my visit to Reddishaws with uh, my honourable friend, where they showed me the, I think, a world first in a bicycle that was printed on a, uh, uh, on, a, uh, on, a on a 3D printer. And, um, I didn't get on and give it a try, but it looked like it would even carry someone of my weight. He's right, because the single market is 500 million people, and that is a great market for our businesses, for our services, and increasingly the market and the supply chain is getting more and more integrated, and that is why we should think very carefully before separating ourselves from it. Alistair Carmichael. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Brain tumours are the biggest cancer killer of children and people under 40, but despite this, Research into them receives less than 1% or just over 1% of the UK's national spend 
on cancer research. This is going to be the subject of a debate next Monday in Westminster Hall. Will the Prime Minister have a word with his right hon. Friend, the Secretary of State for Health, so that the Minister answering that debate might be able to bring with him or her some long overdue good news of change in this area? Well, I'm very happy to do uh, exactly as he says. It is an important issue. We invest something like 1.7 billion a year in health research, but there is always this question when it comes to cancer research. Uh, the spending has gone up by a third over the last Parliament to nearly £135 million, but there's always the question about whether that is fairly distributed between all the different types of cancer, and I'll make sure the Minister can give him a very full reply. Chris Green. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I have a still producer at the heart of my constituency, and so share concerns raised about the future of our steel industry and more widely of energy intensive manufacturing. Yeah, yeah. North of England still has significant manufacturing, but it's been held back by green taxes, high energy costs, and emissions targets. What more can my right honourable friend do to help energy intensive industries? Yeah. Well, I think my honourable friend raised an important point, and the changes we're making are going to save the steel industry over £400 million by the end of this Parliament, and that is a good example of the steps we can take. There was an excellent debate yesterday in the House about this issue. We need to work on everything we can do in terms of procurement. We need to make sure that we're taking action in the EU against dumping, and we are. We need to make sure we reduce uh, the energy costs where we can, and we stand by to work with any potential purchaser uh, of uh, the Port Talbot works, which will safeguard steel jobs in other parts of the country, to see how we can help on a commercial basis. I'm absolutely satisfied we're doing everything that we possibly can. We cannot totally buck the global trend of this massive overcapacity in steel and massive decline in prices, but those are the key areas in terms of power, in terms of plant, in terms of procurement, all areas where we can help. Even Tim's. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Research by the Sutton Trust shows that turning schools into academies doesn't necessarily improve them. At thousands of excellent primary schools, parents want them to continue to be maintained by their local authority. Why are ministers planning to overrule parents and force all those schools to become academies? I think all the evidence shows that academies work as part of our education reforms. Let me give. Uh, let me give the House of Commons let me give the, House the, the, the evidence. If you look at those schools that converted into academies, 88% of them are either outstanding or good schools. If you look at the sponsored academies, often failing schools, hold on. If you listen, if you listen uh, to the, if you look at what happened with the schools that were often failing but were actually now sponsored by academies, you've seen on average a 10% improvement over the first two years. So all the evidence is the results are better, the freedoms lead to improvements, and also where there are problems, intervention happens far faster with academies. We have got 1.4 million more children in good or outstanding schools, and I say let's finish the job. Nigel Hovelston. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the Prime Minister has met many great people, but I believe he has yet to meet the uh, Vale of Evesham's very own Gus the Asparagus Man. <laughs> Would he like to overcome that omission by joining me in the Vale of Evesham for the upcoming British Asparagus Festival, which starts on St George's Day, and show his support for our fantastic farming industry? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, I'm happy to say that um, my honourable friend's constituency is only one constituency away. We share the same railway line, so if there's an opportunity for some great British asparagus, I'd be very happy to join him. Jenny Mr. Chapman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I, take the, can I take the Prime Minister back to his response to the honourable member for Pendle? And I've met Mr and Mrs Clough too. It was a truly dreadful case. Women's refuges, Mr Speaker, are facing an absolute crisis. Yes. The changes that the government proposes to make to housing benefit will force the closure of women's yes. refuges. Yes. He needs urgently to look again at these changes, because unless he makes refuges exempt, they will be closing up and down the country. Yeah. Will he do it? Yeah. What I want to say to the Honourable Lady is what, what we did in the last parliament with rape uh, crisis centres, we are doing the same type of thing with these refugees, and that's why the £80 million of funding is so important. And that is why uh, my uh, right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, has written to local authorities to explain that this money is available to make sure those refugees are there. 
Mrs. Cheryl Gillen. Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker, as part of World Autism Awareness Week last week, the National Autistic Society launched its biggest ever awareness campaign called Too Much Information, and young Alex, the star of the film, was here in the House and met many MPs on Monday this week. Their research shows that some 50% of autistic people and their families don't sometimes even go out in public because they're afraid of what people think and the public reaction to them. Will the Prime Minister meet with me and the charity to discuss how the government can support this campaign and how we can help tackle the social isolation of so many families through this campaign and through government assistance? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, let me pay tribute to my right honourable friend who's been campaigning and legislating on this issue yeah, yeah. now for many, many years, including the landmark legislation that went through in the last Parliament. We've been working closely with the Autism Alliance and have invested some £325,000 since 2014, but she's right, there's more that needs to be done in terms of helping families with autistic children and raising the profile and the understanding of what having an autistic child or being autistic is all about. And I think she's absolutely right to do that. Let me put in a plug for the strange incident of the dog in the night, which I think is still available at the, I think it's the Whitehall Theatre. I took my children the other day. It's absolutely excellent. We'll give you a better explanation of autism than perhaps anything we can discuss in this house. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Authorities in Peru, El Salvador and Panama have raided offices of Mossack Fonseca, seizing documents and computer equipment. But no one has knocked on the door of the law firm's branch here in the UK. Now, whilst recognising the operational independence of our enforcement agencies, does the Prime Minister share my deep concern that, as we speak, documents are no doubt being shredded and databases being wiped undermining the opportunity to bring further potential wrongdoing to light. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, the Honourable Lady makes an important point, um, which is we need to make sure that all the evidence coming out of Panama is properly investigated. That is why we've set up a special cross-agency team, including the National Crime Agency, the HMRC, uh, and other relevant bodies to make sure we get to the bottom of what happened. But she is right to reference the fact these organisations are operationally independent. It would be quite wrong for a minister or a prime minister to order an investigator into a particular building into, in a particular way. That is not a Rubicon we want to cross in this House. So empower the National Crime Agency, empower the HMRC, give them the resources and let them get on with the job. Andrew Griffiths. Mr Speaker, can I draw the Prime Minister's attention to the tragic death of Aisha Jane Smith in my constituency. Aisha was 21 months old when she was stamped on by her mother so violently that it punctured her heart. The pathologist said her body resembled a car crash victim. Yet Aisha had been known to social services since the day she was born. They knew about the violent boyfriends. They knew about the domestic violence. They saw the, the doors kicked in. They smelt the cannabis. They saw the bruises. They saw the cuts. They saw the fingerprints on her little thighs, and they did nothing. The Prime Minister will understand that people in Burton want to know how this could have happened. Yet they are concerned to know that the Serious Case Review has on its panel people who are directly involved in the organisations being investigated. Will the Prime Minister look at what we can do to make this and other Serious Case Reviews more independent so that we can make sure that no other child suffers the life and the death of Aisha Jane Smith. Yeah. I think my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise this. Um, obviously, in the work that we all do, we get to hear about some hideous and horrific incidents. But anyone watching television that night and seeing the description of what happened to Aisha, it simply took your breath away that people could behave in such a despicable and disgusting way towards their own children. And there's no punishment in the world, in my view, that fits. Uh, that sort of uh, crime carried out by uh, the child's own parent. As he says, there will be a serious case review. I'll look very carefully at the suggestions he makes, and I know that my right hand friend, the Secretary of State for uh, Education, will do so as well. There are criticisms of the way these cases are done, but I think to start with, in this case, we must get on with the serious case review because we've got to get to the bottom of what went wrong. Jay Stevens. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, there are currently over 7,000 people in the UK needing an organ transplant, including 139 children, and many will die because of the shortage of available organs. The Welsh Labour Government has already introduced groundbreaking legislation for opt-out organ donation in Wales. Will the Prime Minister join me in supporting the Change the Law for Life campaign for opt-out organ donation 
throughout the UK. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always happy to look at this again. I've, I've looked at it before and haven't come out in favour of opting out. We debated, I think, in the last Parliament and made quite a lot of moves to making opt-in much easier. And we found that if you look at different hospitals, different areas of the country, there's very different records in terms of how well they do. So my personal position is that's something we should support and continue to drive. But this House of Commons can vote you know, from time to time on this issue about whether it wants to go down the Welsh track rather than the track we're on. Personally, as I say, let's make opt-in work better. Mr Gary Streeter. My right hon. Friend will be well aware that our colleague Lord Bates has just started a 2,000-mile walk from Buenos Aires to Rio de Janeiro, uh, in, arriving in time for the Olympics to raise awareness for the Olympic truce and money for refugee children. Will my right hon. Friend join me in wishing Lord Bates well on this epic journey and also committing his government to uphold the values and principles of the Olympic truce? Now, well, I've already written to Michael Bates to wish him well on this long walk and to give support for the work he's done over many years for the Olympic truce. He leaves me a bit of a hole in the House of Lords where he's been doing fantastic work uh, uh, for the Home Office on security issues. So we wish him a good walk and a speedy return. <laughs> Dr Rupa Huck. Mr Speaker, at Ealing Hospital, the technically junior, though highly experienced, doctors I met with last week are dismayed that the government's own equality assessment of their new contract finds that it discriminates against women, which is over half of them. As the Prime Minister is a self-confessed feminist, leading a progressive government, who he reversed, <laughs> so he says, Reverse this blatant injustice, which has no place in 2016. Yeah. Well, I'm grateful to the honourable lady for her uh, question and backhanded compliment. Uh, I would say, actually, this this contract is actually very pro-women because it actually involves a 13% basic pay rise because it restricts the currently horrendous hours that some junior doctors are working that are unsafe and because it gives greater guarantees about levels of pay and the amount of money that doctors will get, I actually think as people start to work on it and work with it, they'll see it's very pro-woman. Jacob Rees-Mogg. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Over 200,000 economic migrants came from the European Union in the period for which we've got figures. And yet the propaganda sheet sent out to the British people claims we maintain control of our borders. Have we withdrawn from the free movement of people, or is that sheet simply untrue? The the truth is this. Economic migrants that come to the European Union do not have the right to come to the UK. They are not European nationals. They are nationals of Pakistan or nationals of Morocco or nationals of of, uh, Turkey. None of those people have the right. And so this is very important. And frankly, this is why it's important we do send information to households so they can see the truth about what is being proposed. What my right honourable friend has just put forward is classic of the sort of scare story we get. Britain has borders. Britain will keep its borders. We've got the best of both worlds. Stephen Patterson. Mr Speaker. Stirling University and my constituency is Scotland's University of Sporting Excellence. But elite sports have been rocked over recent months by an international doping scandal that threatens to see entire countries thrown out and banned from major sporting competitions. Does the Prime Minister agree that in this Olympic year the World Anti-Doping Agency needs further support and can he tell me what further action can be taken? Well, I think he's right to raise this issue. The World Anti-Doping Agency has made a lot of uh, advances in recent years. Uh, There's a relevance here to our anti-corruption summit on May the 12th, where we're going to be looking at corruption in sport and bringing forward new codes of practice that we will adopt in this country and we hope others will adopt. There's also the question about whether doping should be made a specific criminal offence, which I think is something we should be looking at and debating in this House. Murison. What progress has been made in implementing Sir Bruce Keogh's 10 clinical standards published in December 2013 and that are absolutely essential for rolling out the seven-day NHS? 
Well, perhaps I can write specifically on the clinical standards, but the truth is that what is good is that Bruce Keogh and others within the NHS support this vision of a seven-day NHS and recognise that, of course, we should pay tribute to all those doctors and nurses who work at weekends already, because that's a very important point. But what we're trying to move towards is an NHS where the individual has access to their family doctor seven days a week and also where hospitals work on a more seven-day basis, because that will save lives and improve care. And I'll write to him about the specific detail. Finally, Catherine West. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey. Parent governors play a key role in local schools, supporting their children's education and performing an important civic duty. Is the Prime Minister aware of the sadness and anger which has resulted from the forced academy's announcement that the duty for each school to have parent governors will be removed? Will the Prime Minister urgently review this attack on parents? I'm, I'm absolutely delighted the Honourable Lady asked this question, because I know we're going to be debating it later today. But let, let me be clear. We support parent governors. We think parent governors have a great role to play. But no school should think that simply by having parent governors you've solved the problem about how to engage with parents. But let me say to the Honourable Lady, there's something in the Labour motion today that is actually inaccurate and should be withdrawn. The Labour motion says that the White Paper proposes the removal of parent governors from school governing bodies. It does no such thing. So as well as not getting his tax return on in in time, he's bringing forward motions to this House that are simply wrong. Order!